an extremely important subject is witnessing to the lost. And I would like to thank the viewer for requesting this uh, because it is a subject that needs to be covered and it's probably not covered often enough. So witnessing to the lost of the world is the subject matter that I'm going to talk about uh, in this sermon lesson. Please look at the screen or turn in your Bibles, Luke chapter 4, I'm going to read verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. So lots of spiritual vocabulary here. Uh, basically, as Christians, we need to visit people that are not Christians, people that have not yet received the Holy Spirit, because uh, they are blind. They don't have spiritual sight. They're in the prison of Babylon. They're being held captive, and they are bruised, which is an association of being a lost person. So this is the important topic that I want to get into. So the purpose of this sermon lesson, first and foremost, is what is a good witness? And then I'm going to talk about witnessing techniques. Reactions that you would expect to get from people in the mission field, as I will call it. I'm going to give some witnessing stories and accounts. Many of these will be my own. Uh, some of them will be uh, stories that I receive from other people, and I'm sure that most people listening or watching have their own accounts to give, but I just want to throw this in to make sure that, uh, that I cover all different types of scenarios during the witnessing process uh, that happens. And then types of lost people, I'm going to take it back to scripture and just give some examples there, and I'll give a conclusion. So I'm going to get right into this. Um, a place of famine has great hope. I'm not quoting scripture. I'm giving an idea here. You can see Isaiah chapter 35. That's a great chapter that captures the idea of great hope that God gives us, that he will restore those that are famished and give sight to the blind and heal those that are sick. But Isaiah 35, I invite everyone to read that chapter uh, for some encouragement. Uh, and the world, Babylon, that we live in is a place of famine. Jesus Christ asked the question, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith? And of course, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, questioning whether his word would even be found in the world, and if so, would anybody believe it? And it's something that we all need to think about. The reality is, Scripture cannot be broken, but it has been in, in many cases. And you have to diligently seek God out and trust in Jesus Christ to lead you to all truth. So what is a good witness? First and foremost, you have to know God's word. But there's more to it than that. I mean, there's a lot of people that are unsaved that know God's word just to mock it or quote scripture to impress others or to impress themselves. But first and foremost, you have to know God's word. Well, what is God's word? Know the difference between the pure word of God, which in the English language is the authorized version of 1611, and all these lamps of Leviathan, Antichrist Bibles that flood the markets, as God tells us about. Um... Uh, you know, for example, uh, modern Bibles, and I've, I've got many videos on this. I don't want to get sidetracked, but know God's word and be convicted about it. Have the Holy Spirit. You must be a saved person to witness. You are going into a situation where if you're not saved, the evil spiritual realm that surrounds us is going to uh, have its way with you because God has spoken it you don't have the covering of the blood of Jesus Christ, if you're not saved, uh, it's open season for Satan on people that are trying to witness to the lost. Pray for guidance. 
that's important. We always want to pray and ask Jesus Christ to give us the conviction that we need and the direction that we need to be effective witnesses. Trust God by faith. You have to have faith and you have to be confident. Uh, you have to know the mission field. Know what you're getting in. Uh, don't judge by appearance. Judge righteous judgment. You can't judge the world looking at it through the eyes of the television viewer or whatever. It is a fallen evil world out there with unspeakable realities that most of us just don't want to accept. And people are passing away every day without knowledge of the truth and without being born again. And that's the mission field that we're targeting. Understand salvation. If you're a witness, you have to understand, well, you know, what's the point of witnessing? So that people can hear the word of God and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved. So you have to understand, what is salvation? And, uh, and I'm going to talk about that, but my comment would be, salvation is ultimately not only when a person decides that they believe the pure word of God, when God sends the Holy Spirit because he examines that person and God verifies that they are in fact a true believer and then he sends the Holy Spirit. So that's salvation. It's a process where it ultimately comes from God trying the individual. And then be joyful and confident. If you ask anything in the name of Jesus Christ, it shall be given to you. So you have to be joyful and confident when you're in the mission field to be a good witness. You don't want to go out there lamenting and, and being wishy-washy and not being sure of yourself. So you want to be grounded in good faith, knowing the word of God. And please consider these, uh, these items that I've just reviewed for being a good witness. And then fear not. There's nothing to fear but the fear of God. And if you're a true Christian, you're a friend of Jesus Christ, and the only, you should still fear God, but you're only going to wind up uh, getting corrected if you get out of line with God. Other than that, you know, God gives us all power over the power of the enemy, uh, the wicked one. So uh, fear not when you're witnessing. Verses that you need to know, or I'm going to suggest some verses of scripture that would be good to know when you're out in the mission field witnessing. Acts chapter 16, verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's really a great one to sum things up. You know, you don't have to burn candles. You don't have to pay indulgences. You don't have to um, say certain types of repetitive prayers. You don't have to give all your money to the church. You don't have to uh, listen to this person or listen to that person. You just simply must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to continue that because believing on the Lord Jesus Christ means that in 1 Peter chapter 1, you're being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. God's word is incorruptible. It's pure and the scripture cannot be broken. Matthew chapter 7, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Basically, it's good to, to understand that few find salvation, and many Christians or that many people that profess to be a Christian haven't received the Holy Spirit, as it says in that same chapter. John chapter 3, verse 16, one of the most well-known verses in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
you're condemned already. Everybody is born unto trouble and condemned already. So uh, the, the, the judgment is condemnation for all, and you must be born again out of this world of the Holy Spirit to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And also 2 Corinthians chapter 2, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. It's likely that that verse is not known by very many people who profess to be Christians because it's unique to God's word and has been changed in virtually every modern Bible to say something entirely differently. So these are just a selected group of verses that I recommend you know if you're going to go out in the mission field, but don't be limited to only these. Know your Bible very well. The more you know God's word, the overall better and more effective witness you will have the potential to be, and God will use you for great things. You must be saved to witness to people, as I mentioned earlier. In Acts chapter 19, it says, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priest, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And then, and the man in whom the evil spirit was, leapt on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. So one possessed man overtook the whole group of them and made the group flee. That's how much strength and power he had over these professing, witnessing people or these professing believers or these exorcists. So you want to be saved. You have to be saved to witness. You don't want to go out into a mission field where Satan has been given dominion in this world and start witnessing the true word of God to people if you're not a true believer, you will wind up having problems. It says in Acts chapter 8, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God and to him that they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they that were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. This is a great lesson that applies today. We've got you know, televangelism, we've got pastors coming out of seminaries, we've got the merchants with their their videos and their podcasts and all this stuff. And, and a lot of people puffed up out there, respected by the so-called Christian community, and 0% of them use and believe the pure word of God, which is, in, which is the AV 1611 in English, not the KJV that is commonly uh, thought to be so today. So we've got a great example right now in the current time of sorcery going on and God tells us that uh, by the sorceries of Babylon all nations were deceived and if it were possible even the very elect would be deceived by her false Christ and false prophets from her corrupt Bibles. The lamps that come out of her false Christ Leviathan's mouth, see Job chapter 41, verse 19. So this is a great example here. You have to be saved, saved as a Christian to be an effective witness. Simon wasn't saved. 
and he was getting great audiences and great respect and admiration from a bunch of people, and and nobody was getting saved. Nobody received the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like today. We got all these so-called famous Christian men or famous Christian celebrities. Who's getting saved? I see hardly anyone getting saved out there, and that's consistent with how men deceive people and beguile people with sorcery, which is idolatry, which is any subtle corruption of the Word of God and any focus on the individual person rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is because of belief on the Lord Jesus Christ, not, oh, I like this pastor or this pastor, and he really knows the Lord. You cut to the chase, you have the pure Word of God, you believe the testimony or you don't. You can't pick and choose. Either believe all of it or don't believe any of it. But don't be in the middle zone. Witnessing techniques. Talk to the person, first of all. It's the most common witnessing technique. If you look at uh, the accounts of witnessing in the Bible, I mean, uh, Christians talking with prospective Christians was probably the most common way for, for witnessing to happen in God's Word. Talk to people. Pray and ask for a conviction from the Lord to put you in situations where you can be an effective witness so that you can talk to a person. Know your Bible and trust God to guide the process. There's also an option of tracks. My suggestion would be you can take pure scripture. If you have a computer, you can make your own tracks. Just make sure it's the right Bible and that you're uh, responsible with how you're organizing your witnessing tracks. You can give God's word as a gift. I've given the authorized version of 1611 uh, to a number of people. Uh, sometimes I buy the I have purchased the bigger font Bibles from Gordon Campbell and given those out to people. Sometimes it's the smaller font Hendrickson Bibles. But I've given uh, God's Word as gifts to a number of people. So that's an idea. Pray. You can pray for someone. I was just down in downtown Chicago and walking around, you know, uh, the city and saw some homeless people, but I was with a, my, my family and... Uh, I, I, I actually stopped and wanted, I wanted, that was the problem. I wanted a witnessing opportunity. I don't know if God quite was ready to make that happen. So what I was convicted to do was pray for the homeless people that God would uh, send them a conviction and that they would receive the truth. It's heartbreaking for me seeing someone uh, on a street corner that has nowhere to stay. And so uh, I've also... Uh, done other things with homeless people before, but most recently I just had to pray because of the situation I was put in. Okay, reactions from people. Uh, when you witness to people, sometimes, or a lot of times, you don't get any reaction. You don't know what they're thinking. You could preach the truth to someone, and they might not visibly react at all or say anything. That's typical. Um, and that's okay. It's all about if God examines a person, then he will send the Holy Spirit to them if they're a true believer. We have no control over whether a person gets saved or not. All you can do or all we can do is deliver the message of truth from God's word. And the rest is between the individual and God. Sometimes you get violent opposition. Uh, I've had this happen to me a number of times, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in a short time here. But uh, sometimes people, for whatever reason, they could be spiritually afflicted or whatever, violently react to Christian witnessing. And then some have a complete meltdown where they just lose their minds. I've seen this happen as well. Uh, a lot of times, you know, when I witness to people that, that profess to believe be real KJV Bible believing Christians, and I tell them, well, their their KJV is not that the 1611 Bible is a completely different testimony, and it says completely different things, and you can't just play a shell game with the Word of God and trust the Babylonians to refine the text. They they melt down a hundred percent of the time, complete meltdown. It's just it's it's 
something to really, you know, think about that even the, by appearances, the most sincere believers have problems as well when they're witness to. Uh, and they may not be lost people. They may be saved people that God has just kept in a spirit of slumber until the time that he wants to, uh, to open their eyes up. Uh, sometimes you witness to people and they exhibit a conviction. And that conviction hopefully is a real conviction, but they exhibit a conviction of belief. You can tell that the words that you're speaking from ultimately God's word are piercing them as God talks about. And that's a, a great situation uh, if, if you see people that are convicted. And then sometimes you just get a complete dis a reaction of disbelief or laughter, like, oh, this is, you know, this is foolish to them. You know, they make jokes about Jesus or they make jokes about Christianity. Sometimes that happens. So you have to be really prepared for all scenarios and not discouraged by any reaction that you get because we really don't have any control over reactions. All we can do is deliver the message and be good witnesses. Don't uh, start to let people's reactions influence how you then react. Don't become angry or melt down or laugh yourself. Uh, do all things decently and in order and you'll, you'll get the job done as far as uh, what God's will is. Witnessing accounts. I'm going to give some examples uh, from from uh, a number of testimonies here. Uh, first of all, uh, my first account is I was at a restaurant with a friend of mine, a buddy of mine. We were talking about uh, some projects that I was involved in. I think it's during the time that I was producing a number of films, uh, notably A Lamp in the Dark, Tears Among the Wheat, in a bridge to Babylon, and we were talking in the restaurant about the differences between the real word of God and all the counterfeits in the market today. Long story short, a lady a couple of tables over heard our conversation and bought our lunch for us. My friend and I got a free lunch that day. We, we didn't want to have her uh, pay for our lunch, but she insisted, and she said we were a blessing to her, and she needed to hear what we were saying. So that was kind of an unplanned bonus witnessing, I suppose. Uh, but nice to have every once in a while that God gives us encouragement in in the field when we're, we're you know, professing a belief in him. Uh, one time I was in a restaurant, actually a bar area, and I was talking about, uh, you know, what God's word says to a bunch of people, because I'm not shy at all. I like to hear myself talk, and I, I I am appropriate, but my voice carries, and somebody heard me from across the bar and got really upset, and then I kept talking, and I said, I'm going to talk about, you know, what the abomination of desolation is now, and he started pointing at me. He says, don't, don't, don't. Now, it, I didn't want to make a scene in the bar, uh, and I didn't want to have the restaurant manager have a scenario to deal with, so... I backed down a little bit, but uh, um, that was a reaction because perhaps God just didn't prepare this person to hear some of the things I was talking about. Uh, one time, uh, a person started asking me questions, and I knew what they were going to ask me in advance. It's like God was giving me the power to read their mind, and I had the answers prepared because of God's power before they even finished asking their questions. And that that testimony I've heard from other people that have gone witnessing as well. When the Holy Spirit takes over and God does the work for his reason and his cause. Sometimes I see people, when I witness to them, they get deep convictions. One person couldn't finish working on their shift. They had to go on break because of uh, just a deep conviction. There's actually been several accounts like that that I can think of. Um, one of my, my favorite type of witnessing is when somebody comes and witnesses to me. I've got the Jehovah's Witness people who have, at least I'll give them credit, they get out and they knock on doors, and I give them credit for that, but I love when they knock on my door because in my house I keep my 
1611 Bible about 10 feet from the front door. So um, not too long ago, I had a, a guy from the Jehovah Witnesses, maybe a couple of them, uh, knock on my door, and they use the New World Translation, which is a Jesuit Bible, as I tell them. And I know the Bible, the New World Translation, better than the Jehovah's Witnesses do. And so God uses me. I'm not bragging, but because of my background as a Catholic from a Jesuit-influenced upbringing, I'm able to be effectively witness to them. So they'll sit there and they'll talk to me about God's Word, and I'll go get my Bible. I'll say, okay, here's God's Word. What does your Bible say? Because your Bible is a Catholic Bible, and it was formulated by a couple Jesuits. And they didn't know that, and they go in their preface, and they see that I'm right. And I go, well, you tell me, what, what chapter do you want to go to? I said, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. Or for, for that matter, I'll, I'll quote any verse, Adam, and I'll tell them what it says in their text, but I'll first tell them what God says. And so I had a 45-minute long discussion the last time they knocked on my door, and I sent them away speechless because of God's power. And, and God will, you know, I delight when he has people knock on my door because I'm, I just love it. It's a great opportunity to witness to them, and I hope that they go back and get saved and that they are used by God as, as vessels of honor to go back and, and, and preach the truth to the people in their churches. Uh, so that's, that's another quick account that I wanted to talk about. I use every situation in my life as an opportunity to do God's will. I was at a grocery store. I witnessed to a nun. Because I was raised Catholic, and I know the Catholic uh, Church and the Catholic uh, beliefs inside and out, uh, I was able to talk to a nun, was able to have, and I prayed about it a little bit, have a reasonable conversation with her. She, her, she just seemed like she just wasn't able to comprehend, or God had not yet prepared her for uh, for that moment in terms of getting a conviction, but you know, if, if she's one of God's long-term, maybe 10 years from now, he'll bring back those words that were spoken and convict her then. Uh, that's the hope that I have. But uh, I'm glad that I, I had a chance to walk up and witness to her. And I didn't come out with guns blazing. I didn't let her know that you know about my Catholic background. I just started asking her questions, following the Lord's convictions. Of course, witnessing to my immediate family, let's just say, my brother, my sister, my mother, my father to start with, and then, of course, uh, my children. I married a Christian woman, so I never witnessed to her. She witnessed to me, in fact. But that's been a blessing. And witnessing to my immediate family, as Jesus Christ says, it creates division. Some people get saved. Some people don't. Um, my children absolutely got saved. They came forward, testified of being chastened and received by God. Uh, asked to be baptized, professed to believe the word of God with all their hearts, and uh, they got saved. Uh, my brother got saved uh, after uh, living a life for about 40 years of being a lost person. Uh, the word of God pierced him, and he got saved, and his life has turned around completely as a result. Unfortunately, not everybody in my immediate family has gotten saved. My, to this day, my mother and my sister are not saved. And, uh, and we pray for them that God would uh, prepare them for salvation at some point. Uh, and uh, that's all I wanted to say there. At this point, user discretion for the next five, ten minutes or so, because I'm going to give some witnessing accounts for mature audiences only. So if you're a child or if you're under the age of 18 or if you're a babe in Christ, uh, if you're someone that is not sure you want to hear about some real witnessing accounts that may be a, a little bit uh, out there in terms of their content, and uh, then please pause the video or fast forward about 10 minutes at this point until you, you see, uh, until it, I'm cleared of the following slide here. Thank you. So I'm going to get on with some mature witnessing accounts. First of all, I'm going to start easy here. Church visitors, the church that I'm at right now, we've had a number of visitors come into our church over time, and some have gotten very angry in church to the point where I could almost see contortions 
on their face, almost as if they were shape-shifting. Not quite. But just you could see spiritual torment inside of them because of what was said about the AV-1611. The AV-1611 Bible in English, the one that King James authorized, is different from the KJV, and it seems to quite often incite uh, uh, a lot of people that think of themselves as these Bible believers. And, uh, and it's created some interesting reactions uh, from some of the sermons and some of the things that have gone on in our church over the years. Uh, the second account is uh, from uh, my pastor, uh, Pastor Jacoby, who uh, passed away a few years ago and I took over for him, uh, told me when he, in the early years, when he first started serving at this church in Carpentersville, Illinois, he had a witch floating around a vehicle out in the parking lot, uh, you know, just trying to make trouble. And that same witch appeared again at a gas station floating around another vehicle a couple feet off the ground. Um, and, of course, he acted responsibly and, he didn't ignore the witch. He just, uh, I think he prayed to God and, and you know, it never never saw the witch ever again. Uh, and that's important. If you're being tormented by a spiritual being or by someone that is possessed, just ask God with confidence uh, to take care of the matter in whatever way God wants to. And uh, it will be given to you. Uh, also, in the community surrounding the church in Carpentersville, uh, my previous pastor told me about uh, what he called the Daughters of Satan, uh, young women in their late teens, early to mid-twenties that would get pregnant on a regular basis because of satanic sacrifice going on in our immediate community. Uh, and they were called by the, the satanic cult, the Daughters of Satan, okay? Um, and they were asking for help from the pastor, and this is before my time at church, and such activity I'm sure still exists, but uh, he was able to pray for them, and whatever God's purpose was for putting him in contact with these young women, uh, I'm sure God is in control and is doing in accordance with his will with that. But just be advised that this is the mission field. This is what's going on around us, and if you're not saved, you're probably oblivious. Most people are probably completely oblivious to this type of subject matter. Uh, another account that I heard from somebody was a, uh, a biker from a biker gang of some type, I'm assuming, was being witnessed to by a couple of guys maybe out of the seminary, and, and they were witnessing to him, and he shapeshifted and turned into a werewolf, and scared the guys that were witnessing to him until some old lady shows up and rebukes the werewolf in the name of Jesus Christ, and then he reverse shapeshifts back into the biker and flees in fear. It's a real story. I completely believe it. I mean, all this, to me, as a Christian and as a pastor, this is all extremely real stuff. I've been in the middle of this stuff. I've seen things that, you know, I, I don't want to go on and on and on and rant about, but, you know, read the Bible. When Jesus cast out evil spirits and talks about sea monsters and stuff, it's all very real. Uh, there's nothing fictitious about it, as the heathens believe. So this is the mission field that we're in. Uh, another one that was a great witnessing story was a bank teller uh, getting a drive through back in the day, back in the late 70s, early 80s from somebody that was sending a tithe to the Church of Satan, the visible Church of Satan, not the Roman Catholic Church, which is really the high Church of Satan, the Babylonian Church that reigns over the kings of the earth. Just the visible Church of Satan, the lower church that, you know, like Anton LaVey, that type of stuff, you know, just the, the, the put-ons, the fronts for the, you know, the concealed Church of Satan, which, which uh, remains uh, unknown to most people. But uh, this Satanist was putting their, uh, writing a check to the Church of Satan, and this, this bank teller wrote a note, I'll be praying for you in the name of Jesus Christ. And long story short, in a matter of a short amount of time, this Satanist lost his power, and five years later was converted and became 
a very important person in witnessing to people that are caught up in the occult activity. Um, and the last one on the list is when I went out to Los Angeles before the Holy Ghost fell on me. Uh, this was probably six, six to eight months before I received the Holy Ghost. Uh, but I was a professing believer and was as sincere as anyone. I just uh, was beguiled by sorcery. Somebody had given me some corrupt Bibles. I went to witness uh, in Los Angeles, or at least witness witnessing. You know, I was going to be an observer to a group of people that were doing street witnessing because I really, you know, first of all, I wasn't saved, but I didn't realize that. Secondly, I really didn't know the Bible all that well, having been raised Catholic and you know, it was all very brand new to me, but I remember parking in a parking garage, and right before I get out of the car to go watch the street witnessing, uh, an evil spirit attacks me in my car, and I could feel this devil in like crawling up inside me in my arm. It was the weirdest feeling, uh, you know, and and it wasn't a complete shock because I had lived in a house where I had a. a devil or a number of devils try to possess me in my room uh, so I'd been down that road before but this thing was attacking me and you know I wasn't I don't really get like afraid like a lot of people might but I was a little freaked out didn't know what was going on and uh, and it was just a it, it eventually went away after about a couple minutes I believe and I was able to go out and see some freaky things on the streets of Los Angeles. Groups of witches that would howl and point at the group of people that I was watching, witnessing to others. And, uh, you know, it was, it was great for me to see that. And then when I got saved, when the Holy Ghost fell on me, then it all started to make a lot more sense to me. So I wanted to share those witnessing accounts just because I think it's important that people are aware of this type of stuff. Types of people you may encounter in the mission field. I'm going to take it out of the Bible. Uh, in Acts chapter 16, you've got a damsel possessed by a spirit of divination. And the same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us unto the way of salvation. You know, the cheering section for Christians sometimes are the people that are possessed up to their eyeballs with evil spirits. Look at, praise the Lord, brother, praise the Lord. Oh, look at these men. They show us the way to Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. You know, you don't have to be a Christian to say that type of stuff or to talk that way. And this damsel that was possessed by a spirit of divination was, was kind of like their cheering section. And it's just something that I think we need to, be aware of that when you're out in the mission field, just because somebody says, oh, praise the Lord or praise Jesus, doesn't mean they're a Christian. No one can confess Jesus is the Lord except they do it by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit reveals a true Christian. And, and a lot of times the, 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 these professing Christians that think they're Christians, they just spew nonsense out of their mouth and they use the Lord's name excessively and they act overly nice above and beyond how they should be acting. Just be yourself. Don't try to put on a show for anyone. Acts chapter 10, real believers. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them, on all them which heard the word. There's real believers out there in the world. There's few of them, but there's real believers that when you go witnessing to people, you're going to eventually encounter people that will receive a deep conviction and they'll perhaps receive the Holy Ghost right on the spot. And that's a, a great situation to be in. Acts chapter 8, the peacocks, uh, professing believers, loved by men as great Christians. You know, the merchants, the televangelists, the great preachers in the pulpits, and, you know, all these people re receiving respect and praise of men. Uh, it says in Acts chapter 8, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city, used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. You know, I. the more men get praise in this world, the more I suspect if they're really Christians or not. 
at this stage in, in my walk as a Christian, I can listen to someone and get a conviction whether or not I think they're a true Christian. The Lord's power is tremendous. I've watched televangelists on TV. They're all phony, in my opinion, based on what the Lord has taught me. Uh, had supernatural intelligence from the Holy Spirit on seeing how Satan uses these people to beguile and use sorcery and tickle the ears. And hardly anyone, no one is getting saved, hardly at all. Mark chapter 12, widows who forsake all. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which made a farthing. And she gave all that she had. Okay, The widow is symbolic of a lost person who, when they, when they are put to the test or put to the trial, they forsake all. These are, are not only believers. These are people that believe so much. They trust Jesus. They forsake all that they have. They give everything. They're an empty vessel that God can now fill with his wisdom and use them for great purposes. So this account, that this gives you a good cross-section of what to expect in the mission field, saved and unsaved people and, and their natures. So in conclusion, James chapter 1, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Spiritually speaking, cutting to the chase, pure religion to God is being saved, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and visiting those who are not. Okay, widows and fatherless are lost people. Uh, Women without a husband, without God as the husband, and uh, children without God as their father. Okay, that's how God speaks in spiritual terms. So we as Christians want to use our gifts of the Holy Spirit, the diverse gifts that we have, to get out there and witness and be effective in how we do it, trusting in the Lord to direct our paths. Thanks again to the person that suggested this sermon lesson, and may it be a blessing to everyone listening. Thank you guys.